a lot of people, they, they like to bicker and fuss and have all these weird semantic games about the Trinity. Right. You know, about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And honestly, we need to just get our doctrine on this directly from the Bible. We should go with statements in the Bible, what we believe about this. And, and, you know, a lot of people, they, they like to bicker and fuss and have all these weird semantic games about the Trinity. Right. You know, about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And honestly, we need to just get our doctrine on this directly from the Bible. We should go with statements in the Bible, what we believe about this. Okay. And, and a lot of times man's wording has come in and man's logic has come in and kind of clouded this issue of the Trinity when I don't think it's really as complicated as people make it. I think right. people just, they, they complicate it and they come in with these doctrinal statements, you know, and they talk about, you know, well, is God in three persons or is God in three, you know, and they use these terms that aren't really biblical terms. Is there any biblical distinction between being and personhood? Uh, certainly. Can you give one? you give one? Well, certainly. Uh, the fact that we can speak of mankind generically and speak of individuals personally, and that we can make generic statements about mankind in general, but then make exceptions and speak about persons, demonstrates that all of the biblical writers function on the very same foundation that you and I function on every day. Every day, you and I know that we are human beings, but we also know that we are not all other human beings. We recognize the concept of humanity, and yet we recognize that we as individuals are personal. I have a human, I am a human being, but my being is shared only by one person. In fact, if more than one person shared my being, they'd put me in one of those funny places with a nice comfy, you know, jacket that I wear. So that's unusual for the human being. But remember, the difference is God's being is not limited. Uh, it is infinite and is shared by three divine persons. So I see a category distinction. You know, and they talk about, you know, well, is God in three persons or is God in three? You know, and they use these terms that aren't really biblical terms. Yeah, I don't really use the term God in three persons just because that's not the way the Bible words it. And so it's sometimes dangerous just to bring, and I'm not against anybody who uses that wording because I know what they mean, but it's just, you know, why don't we use the words that the Holy Ghost teaches? In many ways, what we see here of the Father choosing not to work unilaterally, but to accomplish his work through the Son or through the Spirit, extends into his relationship to us. This is where I think it becomes very problematic. Does God need us to do his work? Does God need us to help others grow in Christ? Does God need us to proclaim the gospel so that others hear the good news and are saved? The answer is an emphatic no. He doesn't need any of us to do any of this. Being the omnipotent and sovereign ruler over all, he would merely have to speak and whatever he willed would be done. No, the humbling fact is that God doesn't need any of those whom he calls into his service. Now, a really inappropriate parallel has just been drawn there, in my opinion, uh, because what has, been, what has been drawn as a parallel is us being used as the instruments of God, as the ones who proclaim the gospel, so on and so forth, with the Son and the Spirit. And he goes on to say, it is not as though the Father is unable to work unilaterally, but rather he chooses to involve the Son and the Spirit. Now that to me is, that's over the line. That's, that's just, to me, that's over the line.
but a lot of times people will use the term, uh, you know, the Godhead is in their fancy doctrinal statements is made up of three co-equal persons. Now here's the thing about that. That could be right it, it, depending on how you look at that. See, whenever you start using man's wording, you got to be careful because, you know, co-equal in what sense? They're all, I mean, Jesus is just as much God as the Father is, right? For example, if I said, well, you know, husband and wife are equal, that would be true in the sense that they both have the same value, the same worth, they're both human beings. But hold on a second. There is an authority structure in the Godhead because the Son obeys the Father. That's what the Bible says. And some people freak out when you say that. But you know what? I don't care what your stupid doctrinal statement says. What does the Bible say? Yeah. The Bible, go to 1 Corinthians 15. Because you're in chapter 12, right? Just go a few pages to the right. Look at 1 Corinthians 15 and see what the Bible actually says. First of all, we know that while Jesus was on this earth, he said, not as I will, but as thou will. He said, I do always those things which please him. So who was the boss there? God the Father. And this doesn't take away from the deity of Jesus Christ. This doesn't take away from his value of who he is. This doesn't take away from the fact that he has the preeminence and that in him all the fullness of the Godhead dwelled bodily and, and the fact that, you know, that he is the creator of all things and that all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. But look, he still was obedient to the Father, okay? And look at 1 Corinthians 15, because this is actually in the future, beyond his earthly existence, because you say, well, he just obeyed the Father because he was on this earth. But actually, later on, the Bible says, he will also submit himself unto the Father, even after the millennium. Okay, I didn't have this in my notes. Somebody help me out with the scripture I was looking for. I'm, my, I'm drawing a blank here. I know I'm in 1 Corinthians 15. There it is. Yeah, exactly. Here we go. It says in verse uh, 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign, Jesus must reign, it's saying, till he hath put all enemies under his feet, The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And we know that that reign lasts a thousand years from Revelation. For he hath put all things under his feet. Watch this, verse 27. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. What's that saying? That even... Jesus Christ on this earth obeyed the Father, but even after the millennial reign of Christ, after Jesus rules and reigns on this earth for a thousand years, he will then deliver up the kingdom of the Father. The Father will reign, and Jesus will even submit himself unto the Father at that time also. Oh, bless me! No, this is what the Bible says, right? This is biblical doctrine. You can't just ignore the Bible. I mean, that's what it says. And, and so our understanding of the Trinity should be that the Trinity is, you know, found in 1 John 5, 7, where it says there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. 1 John 5, 7 that's found in the King James Bible says that there are three witnesses in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and these three are one. This is a verse that was added to the Bible in 1522 when Erasmus, who was the first a publisher of any Greek New Testament, got pressure from the church to add this Trinitarian statement because it had been found in some Latin manuscripts. And so there was some scribe by the name of Roy working in 1520 at Oxford, and he writes out this whole Greek New Testament and somehow gets into Erasmus's hands. And Erasmus never made the promise that he'd put it in if, if he found such a manuscript, but he basically said the reverse. I didn't put it in because I didn't find any manuscript. So he finds this manuscript. I'm sure somebody brought it to his door. And he writes in that Greek text, and he actually changes the text from what Roy had written, because Roy didn't know very, Greek very well. He wrote, translated the Latin into Greek, you know, and Erasmus had to make the fixes. But it's not found in our ancient manuscripts. It's found in four 16th century manuscripts, and four manuscripts in the 12th century or later in the marginal note with a 16th or 17th century hand. That's a passage that I'd have to say, this is not authentic.
now that that disputed verse has been removed, there is no verse in the Bible at all which says uh, the number three in reference to God. And that means that we do not have a cap on, on the number of divine persons. You might say, okay, we knew one God, we knew the Father, then we saw the Son, now we know that there are two, and then the Holy Spirit now start to show personal attributes, now we know that there are three. How do you know there's not a fourth? Now manifesting himself in another planet, in another galaxy, uh, somewhere. Uh, that You have no cap on that. Once you open it up, you open it literally a can of gods here. So there's a three in one, okay? So there's one God, but he is made up of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And I think the best illustration of it is we as human beings are a three-part being, body, soul, and spirit. But it's one person. Nobody would say, well, you're talking about three different people. You're making it into three people. No, 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 it's one person. Body, soul, spirit. Partialism, a heresy which asserts that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not distinct persons of the Godhead, but are different parts of God, each composing one-third of the divine. Okay, and these parts can be independent of one another, because when the, when the body dies, then the body is without the spirit, because the spirit departs the body, they give up the ghost. Okay, there's the body, which is a full, functioning mind, because the body includes your brain also. Everything that is flesh is the body, but then there's also the soul and the spirit. And, you know, you could liken our spirit unto the Holy Spirit. You know, you could liken our body unto Jesus, and you could liken the soul unto the Father, however you want to liken it. That's a great illustration. Jesus Christ himself, the great leader of the 12 disciples and the great leader of all the multitudes that followed him, you know, he said, I, I do always those things which please the Father, right? Jesus Christ said to the Father, not my will be done, but thy, he said, not as I will, but as thou wilt. 